is for uh, refer Shlomo for all the Cholim of Klal Yisrael Amen. and uh, continue with the theme of uh, Shmita. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we um, produce grown in Eretz Yisrael on land belonging to a non-Jew has no Kedusha Shvit. This is the widest, widespread opinion of the, the, the Chazid Ish rules. Produce that, 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 that such produce does indeed have Kedusha Shvit. The produce does. Okay, the land doesn't, but the produce does. No Truma or Maisa are taken. Note, one should should be certain that this produce was actually grown on non-Jewish land and is not Jewish produce being sold by a non-Jew. Therefore, it is not recommended to buy from an Arab selling produce on the streets unless one knows definitely that the products were grown on non-Jewish land. Many points can urge minimum usage of non-Jewish produce in general as it strengthens and encourages non-Jewish involvement in Eretz Israel. Now, this is very interesting. Yesterday, I'm on one of these shul groups, and it's, I was, there was a video, a one-minute video was posted at the shiur, and I caught half of it. And this Rov was saying exactly that. He said, um, in order to be, if you know for certain that a uh, Arab farmer has uh, grown the produce and has uh, been involved in the whole process, rather buy from him. It's not a problem to buy from Anandu if you know for certain. During the year of Shmita, in, it's not a problem then still buying in, uh, in that year that it was harvested and, uh, and, and harvested uh, that, that, that fruit to produce as well. You can, that's what they say you can also do. Um, mainstream people, most don't do that, but uh, some people who are very strict don't want to even buy from uh, some of the supermarket chains because they don't consider that strict enough. So that's what some of them do. I'm not, I don't know, uh, Arab farmers or, and they say some stores in B'nai Brak and Jerusalem are selling produce, but they buy it from, a, from an Arab farmer. That's because uh, there's degrees of, of, of humrot and how strict one, one, one can be. Um, and so, as, as, as Okay. All right, so look. We covered a lot of ground yesterday, believe it or not. We went from 52A3 to 52B3. And the reason I did it so quickly is we almost covered a duff yesterday alone. Is because there was a lot of repetitiveness in nature, I didn't want to drag it out. I wanted to get to the bottom line of the discussion. This is going to be a short paragraph on the continued part of the discussion, but... In a slightly different example, I'll tell you where they're similar, and then I'll tell you where they're dissimilar. Okay, so the Gemara starts a conclusive resolution to the latter version of the inquiry. Come in the resolution from the following Bryce. If an ox that is deaf, deranged, young or blind, or a healthy mature that is walking at night, falls into an open pit, the owner of the pit is liable. Okay, but an, if an ox is intelligent and walking by day falls by it, he is exempt. Okay, now that's a brisa, and I want to contrast that uh, with the Mishnah that we learned. So I think I'm going to uh, share the Mishnah first in terms of screen share, and then go back to the brisa because it will make a little bit more sense. Okay, just give me a second, guys. Just why you're doing that, just a quick observation. Uh, I've always been fascinated, we covered it last time as well in the Gemara, how you could discern between an animal that's intelligent and not. It, it's hard yeah. enough to do that with humans. Did you work out who's intelligent and who's not? Now, with animals, to me, it's, 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 I know we have covered it, so let's see your answer. So, uh, two, uh, two points. Uh, we once discussed it in the context of uh, resolving an itch with creating ashes where the animal created a, uh, a fire hazard uh, and we said that it was using it to use the ashes to satisfy an itch and then we also used certain other examples. The reality is it's a very, very difficult one, Gavin, because 
in certain cases we've seen they've showed the behavior of the animal afterwards and shown that there was a reason it did some act because it could uh, extrapolate a consequence but it's very difficult to understand it when in fact intelligence has to be observed i mean how do you know that an animal is automatically intelligent or not well there are a few factors the one factor is looking at the breed the one thing is speaking to people that actually own the animal because i had two dogs the one dog i had was as dumb as two rocks it was a cocker <laughs> spaniel it, it it would eat itself to death it would even uh it was it, it was completely stupid it was the stupidest dog i think in the 12 years we had it it managed three vocab words and you had to gesticulate and and, and we had another dog at the same time that was extremely clever not only picked up big vocab words but uh, was able to discern subtleties. So the owner can discern if the animal is intelligent or not, although Gavin's problem re-arises because it's not going to claim its animal was intelligent if it fell in the pit, because all of a sudden then the pit owner is not liable. If it was a reasonably intelligent animal, he's going to claim, claim his animal was slightly uh, impaired and therefore the pit owner is liable. So it is a difficult one, Gavin. I have no idea. Um, yeah, the, lead, the, default position, the default position, sorry, one second, would be if the animal falls into the pit, it's an idiot, and if it doesn't fall into the pit, it's a clever one. Then. Yeah, the only problem is the liability. It's the first time we're learning in this particular Mishnah that the Gomorrah is in fact discerning. Because up until now, we've only ever learned that if an animal fell in a pit that you created, you liable. It didn't discuss the faculties of the animal and if that would mitigate any sort of responsibility that you'd have. It's the first time we've actually learned it. So your question is actually very relevant at the moment. So let me share the Mishnah before I discuss the Raisa. Now, if you have a look here, um, I want to share at the bottom. I don't know if you can see where my mouse is, guys. Mm. Yeah. If an ox that is deaf, deranged, or young fell in the pit, the owner is liable. So let's just get, discuss that particular part in the Mishnah before we go to the Brysa. In the Mishnah, if an animal is deaf, um, deranged or young, the owner of the pit is liable. Why? Why young? Because young implies inexperienced. So therefore, it's not able to navigate its way around, both in terms of dexterity and experience, to know the hazard involved. Animals, generally, if they get to live longer, they're lucky in the beginning and end up gaining experience so as not to fall in uh, treacherous situations. So a youth, uh, a calf, for example, is easily discernible from an older ox, Gavin. So immediately the physiology would give it away in that case. Okay. Um, if you take a look at an animal that's deaf, well, I don't know. I mean, they didn't exactly have audiologists for uh, veterinary audiologists in those days. I don't know how they determined if the animal was deaf. And I don't know what the difference between a deaf animal and a... If you told me the animal was blind, I can understand it fell in the pit. But what did the deaf animal have to do with it? If anything... No, if digging, that example we did uh, two days ago with the digging in the pit. If it's deaf, it won't jar it. But yes, but... But that's exactly the the uh, the point. That in fact you're proving the opposite, because the, the the fact that it can hear is a deficit. It's not an advantage. Meaning, if an animal can hear, and it fell in the pit because it got a fright, there's liability. We we would would imagine. But if it's deaf, it's not going to get startled. So why would you be liable for a deaf animal? If anything, you're exempt. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't think it through. Uh, so the thing of it is, if it, um, it's not as if it's a lack of vision. I don't understand why it would uh, create a liability. If an animal is deranged, you can understand why. The, uh, but in that case, the owner of the pit should not be liable. Because if an animal is deranged and you say, listen, you've created enough signals around the pit to show that there's a hazard and a normal animal would, uh, would see it. Like maybe you created a step or something that, but an animal that's deranged isn't aware of danger, you should be exempt, not liable, actually. So I don't quite understand. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. 
All right. So anyway, let's just uh, let's just uh, con I want to compare the Mishnah uh, to the Bryson. Let's see what we come up with. If the octet is deaf, deranged, or young fell in the pit, the owner of the pit is liable. What does that imply? That if an animal is more experienced and intelligent, you exempt if it fell in the pit. Okay, that's what it seems to imply. Converse. Okay. Well, it certainly infers that. So what what it's saying here now is that if we have a look at a brysa, the brysa seems to say that if an ox that is deaf, deranged, young or blind, or a healthy, mature ox that is walking at night, why it compares it is because any ox that is walking at night is in fact blind to a certain degree. Does that make sense? Because the uh, the visual uh, impairment at night puts it into the category of blindness. Does that make sense? So, in other words, you've got you've got one category: animal that's are impaired, that are deaf, deranged, young, or blind. So it's either impaired or inexperienced. That's in one category um, during the day. And the other category during the day is if you had a healthy, mature animal during the day. But the minute you're talking about an animal walking at night, according to the Bryce, it becomes impaired as a result of its limited vision. So anyway, so uh, if the ox that is deaf, deranged, young or blind, or a healthy, mature ox that is walking at night falls into an open pit, the owner of the pit is liable. But an ox that is intelligent in walking by day and falls into it, he is exempt. Now, why is he exempt? Let us say then, since he was negligent in regard to a deaf or otherwise impaired ox, he's also considered negligent in regard to an intelligent one. Okay, so what's it, what's it saying there is that if you having a look firstly, uh, why does it exempt an ox that is intelligent in walking by day? Well, simply because as Rashi said, the ox should have, witched, uh, should have basically watched where it was going. It was functional enough uh, from an intellectual point of view. What are we saying? Uh, is we, we, we're saying to answer Gavin's previous question, uh, we can't necessarily measure an intelligent ox, but we can in comparison to an ox that is uh, mentally impaired. Okay, so Gavin, the default position then is an ox is intelligent for its species unless it shows some sort of uh, neurological impairment. Does that make sense? So the default position is if it's intelligent and mature, meaning experienced, it's responsible itself for falling in the hazard. Now, up until this particular Mishnah, we've always learned that if you create a pit, that if an animal falls in, you have to pay for its damage or its death. So this obviously begs a little bit of clarification, which I need to speak to Rabbi Cohen about. How come it never mentioned it before? Is this only an exceptional case? Is it the case of only one of the rabbis? Is it the general opinion? We don't know. So, um, a, so Rashi is saying an animal that's intelligent and experienced should have looked where it was going. And therefore, the one who dug the pit is not considered negligent in regard to that damage because it was big enough to be seen. And it says, now, let's say uh, that since he was negligent in regard to a deaf or otherwise impaired ox, he's also negligent in regard to an intelligent one. So what, what is that actually implying? That's implying that since, Gavin, the pit that you're digging is a hazard in some respect, right? Because uh, the minute you dig a pit, it's a hazard automatically you should be liable for any damage that it causes even though there was no direct negligence regarding that particular damage so what we are saying is that yes an intelligent animal that's experienced shouldn't have fallen in but the fact of it is you created a hazard and the minute you create a hazard there you therefore open yourself up for liability across the board even if you weren't directly negligent and you only seen as negligent according to that opinion with regards to animals that are mentally impaired. Uh, whereas the other opinion is stating that, you know what, you created a hazard. Uh, you, if you never created the hazard in the first place, you wouldn't have had any drama. 
Therefore, there's liability across the board. Does that make sense? So then the Gemara is going to ask one question. Rather, do you not learn from this that we do not say since he was negligent, etc. What do we mean by since he was negligent, etc.? We learn that the owner of a pit is not liable unless his negligence is related to the specific damage that uh, actually occurs. Does that make sense? So then the Gemara basically ends off, and I'm going to explain this. The Gemara uh, basically concludes, indeed, we do, we do learn from this. So what have we learned in this example is, Kevin, if you, if you dig a pit, okay, uh, you are uh, liable if the animal is blind or deranged or lacks experience and falls in it because there's negligence on your part. But if it's an animal that is reasonably intelligent, then it's not your fault in terms of negligence because the animal should have looked where it was going. So that's the principle that we seem to learn from this. Now, this mimics a little bit of the principle of what we dealt with before in terms of if you were negligent regarding the camel cover, uh, are you negligent in regarding the worminess? What does that mean? If you're negligent in one regard, uh, then um, would it take away your exemption status and liability in another regard? Because you've proved yourself negligent. Therefore, you're not afforded that sort of protection. Or do we say that if you were negligent with regards to the cover, of uh, that you built it strong enough for oxen, but not for camels, and camels came power occasionally, that indeed, even if the pit cover had worminess, um, it had nothing to do with the fact that you were slightly negligent with regards to camel weight with your cover. It's something unrelated that damaged the cover, and therefore you're off the hook. So these two parts of the uh, Bryce and the Mishnah are similar issues that they're grappling with. Am I making sense to you guys? So then if that's the case, why bring them if they're trying to teach the same concept? Because you noticed before it didn't say with regards to the camel and the cover, according to all opinions, we learn from the fact that unless the negligence is related to that issue, um, uh, you liable, but otherwise you exempt. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We never learned that with the camel and the cover. We, there were two opinions. The one is that when you're negligent in one regard, uh, uh, you lose your uh, protective status in an unrelated incident because you proved to be negligent. And the other particular um, point of view was that if you're negligent in one regard, you are uh, not necessarily responsible in another regard because of unrelated issues. There were two opinions with the camel cover and the worminess. However, in this particular case with the animals that walk by day that are intelligent and mature, that has no bearing on an animal walking by night, in which case you should have covered the hazard because any animal can fall in by night, or the fact that the animal was mentally impaired uh, and therefore you're liable. So therefore, it's saying that in this situation, there has to be a direct cause of negligence for you to be liable, and it doesn't create negligence across the board. Am I making sense? They're not, they're not the same. Um, just want to deal with one issue. Um, so, let me just see... Uh, I'm just reading and see uh, the, uh, if there's any counter opinion here. Um, okay, so look, that 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 basically uh, covers it. So we we saying there is something that you you've got to know about guys. Sorry, I'm just waiting for a plane to leave. I can hear it in the background, and then I'll get back to you. Really, Gab, you can hear it. Not as loud as what you can hear it, but I can hear it. Okay. So, I, so, so I've, I've, I've explained so far that it is slightly different ruling with the cover for the uh, the cover case with regards to a pit that an intelligent animal fell in. Okay. 
But I want you to know that the Bryce's case is substantially different than the one covering the Gomorrah's case. Why? Because um, if the owner of the pit was negligent in regard to oxen, right? Because he made a cover that stood to be weakened by camels to the point that it couldn't support an ox any longer. An oxen fell into the pit, even because of wor worminess and not through his negligence. It's different to the Bryce's case, okay? Because the Bryce's case was where the pit owner was negligent in regard to impaired animals walking in daylight. But it's saying here an intelligent one fell in during the day. So therefore, there wasn't any negligence at all with respect to the type of animal that was actually damaged. So that's why you can't really make the link. But you can still say in the original case uh, that there is a sort of a link. So, so the Gomorrah answers that basically uh, you can consider that perhaps once a person's dug a, a, a pit in the public domain, you remain liable for any damage that it causes until you completely eliminate the possibility of damage occurring through it. So if that reasoning is correct, it doesn't make a difference whether you left it open for this particular animal and it was damaged by a different one. As long as your, your bore, your pit remains a hazard in some respect, you're liable for all damages. But it's different in the Bryce's case because the, in the Bryce's case, the bore is a hazard to all animals even intelligent ones at night. So during the day, your hazardous nature is reduced. It's not completely eliminated, but it's reduced, right? Because during the day, if the animal's reasonably normal, it's not going to fall in. So therefore, um, the, the continual negligence during the daytime is only regarding impaired animals. A and therefore, um, you know, it, it, it would make him um, culpable even for an intelligent animal um, since it's not completely uh, uh, covered, especially especially at night. So they are slightly different because the, the liability does change at night where even an intelligent animal has a difficulty seeing. So those are why the nuances are being brought up. I don't know if I'm making any sense to you guys. Okay. The Mishnah turns to a case where an animal was caused to fall into a pit by an external factor. If the animal fell forward because of the sound of the person's digging, the owner of the pit is liable. If it fell backwards because of the sound of the digging, he is exempt. Okay. So what do you guys notice there by the wording? Guys, well, Okay, so what I'm saying, does a digging make a person liable or exempt? Depends. If it falls forward, if it falls forward, it's first, then it makes it liable. If it falls backwards, then it's exempt. Correct. So it's not the digging itself that is the issue. It's the combination of the digging and how the animal falls. Now, if there's no digging... Is there liability if the animal falls forward compared to backwards or not? Or you're not sure? It depends, huh? Okay, and what? Usually not. Because uh, uh, I further, uh, it depends on the I opinion. It's, uh, falling f forward is liability, falling backwards isn't. Yeah. This is the, 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 the first thing that's stated. Um, but further on, it says that it doesn't make a difference um, if, if, if uh, it's back, backward or forward uh, falling. Okay, so we're going to deal with two issues. This is what I wanted to clarify from what I could see, is that it's not the digging in, co uh, in uh, combination with the, uh, it's not the sound of the digging in combination with how the animal fell that causes the liability or exemption. It seems to be that the issue of the digging is a separate issue in terms of who pays for the liability. In other words, because the sound of the digging startles an animal. That's very different. It's grammar, which is indirect. Now, Schottenstein translates it as causative damage. 
Now, if I say to you um, that uh, I, was, uh, I was catalyst in setting something alight as a pyromaniac, or it was causative because I put petrol down and somebody jacked up a cigarette, would you hold me liable when I use the English word causative? No. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's the problem I have with the translation of causative. Because the word grama means indirect. We learned this in Sanhedrin. So it's like when you tie somebody up and you wait for the tide to come in and the tide comes in and drowns the person, you're responsible for the death in Shemaim, but you haven't actually held the person underwater. So the base den, the Sanhedrin can't hold you liable with an earthly death penalty, even though in Shemaim you're responsible because that's called indirect. That it's causative in the fact that you caused the death, but the problem with the word causative is confusing if you're an English speaker because it implies that you shouldn't get off the hook. So I want to use the word grama as a being indirect. So the sound of digging is known as indirect because it's as if you startled the animal by the sound and therefore the animal fell in. You never pushed the animal in. And since you never pushed the animal in, you can't be uh, really responsible for the payment according to certain opinions because you never physically drew the animal in. Does that make sense? That's when that issue of the sound of the digging is going to come to the fore in terms of payment and the rabbi's opinion and Rav Nassan. The issue of if the animal fell forwards or backwards seems to be an issue according to if you're holding like Rav Ushmuel, and uh, according into how the animal dies in, uh, with regards to uh, exemption or liability. It seems a different issue to the sound of the digging. It happened to put them together in the Mishnah, but from what I've read so far, they, it, it's not the one issue and the other are not cumulatively creating the exemption or the liability thereof. So when it falls, which is, which is also what I picked up, and when you fall forward, it's from the foul air, and when you fall backwards, it's more from the impact. Excellent, yeah. excellent. So you've done your homework. So that that exactly doesn't have anything to do with this uh, uh, the animal being startled from the sound of the digging. The fact of it is it did fall in because of that, but the two issues are not related. The two issues were brought together in the Mishnah to bring uh, so far two different points of view. It might come to pass later when we study the Mishnah that there is a link between the two. But so far, not really. Does that make sense? So let's go, let's go through a couple of points quickly. Is that, uh, well, well done, Gavin. I can see you've uh, put, put a bit of work into it. So the Mishnah stated, if the animal fell forward because of the sound of the person's digging, the owner of the pit is liable. If it fell backward because of the sound of the digging, he is exempt. So we're trying to focus on the meaning of the word forward and backward. Forward means literally that the animal fell on its face. Okay? And uh, uh, fell backwards means it fell on its back. Okay? And both this ruling and that ruling refer to a case where the animal fell into the pit. So that's another factor we have to take into account, that the animal actually has to fall into a pit for uh, liability, uh, which we'll discuss now. The Mishnah teaches that one who digs a pit in the public domain is liable only if the animal falls in head first and dies because of its foul air, but not if it falls backwards and dies because of the impact. Gavin, that was excellent. Yeah, except for rabbi, except for what's his name? Well, we'll disagree. Yeah. Co co correct. So, uh, I want to know from you before I explain this, who holds like this opinion and why? Do any of you know? Yeah, Rab holds by that. Why? He holds by the foul air. So because he doesn't, but because because the. the in a public domain, and we're presuming it's in a public domain, you don't own the land. So if you don't own the land, then you can't, uh, um, then it can't be from impact. Only, only in your own domain can, 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 if an animal falls into your pit and it's because of impact, are you responsible because the ground belongs to you. 
when the ground doesn't belong to you and it falls there, it's generic land, you know, it doesn't belong to anybody, uh, or it's just general. So you're not responsible according to rough, but the foul air always exists, uh, in, whether in the private or the public domain. So if it's head first, it's, it's due to the foul air. Gavin, I don't know if you're taking cocaine or what, but you're on the mark. I haven't um, seen you so alert for ages. That is absolutely yeah. brilliant. Brilliant. No, it's, uh, perfect. Perfect. Can I add something, Damon? Absolutely. I'm not taking Coke because I can't afford it, but otherwise I could be. He's drinking Coke Zero. That's nearly as expensive as cocaine. <laughs> so anyway, so I think okay. falling forward is definitely liable, but I think if, if someone falls back it's, uh, the, the liability will only come into play if the foul air caused the death. Co correct. So exactly as Gavin said, spot on the mark, this Mishnah is going according to Rav. Because Rav holds, there's only liability in the public uh, pit for the foul air because you don't own the land at which you dug. Therefore, you cannot be responsible for the impact. It's not your, uh, it's not your hole. It's you. You dug there, but it's public property, and therefore the only thing that you're responsible for is the earth that you dug up and the toxicity you created as a result of the dust and the foul air and the uh, and the toxic moisture, etc. That's yours, and therefore Rav says you're only liable for the foul air, not the impact. That's why Gavin said it's perfect that. Uh, if the animal fell forward, it absorbed, it drew into its body the foul air, and that contributed to its death. But if it fell backwards on impact, even if the animal died on impact, you uh, in public property or in public earth, that's not your earth that created the impact. Uh, it's it's public. My question to Rav, which I don't understand, I'm not questioning him, is. Yes, but you created that uh, excavation drop. And since you created that drop by your actions, why aren't you liable, even if it's in the public domain and you don't own the ground? Again, if I take a public statue owned by the public and I drop it on somebody's head, am I not responsible for their death, even though it wasn't my item that killed that person? I, I'm battling to understand the, that reasoning, but Gavin gave it over perfectly. But uh, that, I'm just giving up his, his reasoning. I'm just, it doesn't mean I also. I mean, I I, I prefer Shmuel because he he takes both sides. He says it's either the foul air. If it's not the foul air, then it's the then it's the impact. Yes. So Shmuel, Gavin, uh, Kevin Shmuel is saying exactly that. Is that he's saying, look. At the end of the day, you created the hazard. Doesn't matter if you dug up the dust and it's the foul air or the fact that the animal split its head open on impact or it broke its back on impact. You created it by your actions. In other words, say you pick up a stone that belongs in a park and you throw it and you hit somebody and you kill them. Are you not liable just because it's not? Are you? Are you? Are you not? Are you exempt because it wasn't your stone? No, your actions created it. So it's easier to understand Shmuel based on what I know, but I'm obviously missing something at which I need to speak to Rabbi Cohen. So therefore, uh, I'm just going to interject and just uh, read uh, the Gemara, which obviously uh, Gavin concurs with. So the Mishnah teaches that one who digs a pit in the public domain is liable only if the animal falls in head first and dies because of its foul air, but not if it falls in backwards and dies because of the impact. And the Gemara explains, Rav follows his own reasoning. Concerning the pit in the public domain for which uh, the Torah made the digger liable, it made him liable because of the pit's foul air, which he brought into being and not because of the impact of the fall. So there's a variant interpretation of the Mishnah, which explains Shmuel's point of view, uh, which is if an animal falls into the pit, 
Then whether it falls forward on its face or backwards on its rear, the owner of the pit is liable to pay for the damage. And then the Gemara obviously interjects with an explanation and says, well, what's Shmuel's reasoning? Because Shmuel said concerning a pit in the public domain, the Torah made the digger liable because of the pit's foul air and certainly also because of the impact of the fall into it. Okay. Um, and um, the interpretation of Shmuel resumes because it says, rather, what is the case to which the Mishnah refers when it says that the animal falls backwards because of the sound of the digging, the owner of the pit is exempt. It's a case where the animal stumbles in a pit and upon losing its footing fell backwards uh, of the pit striking the ground outside the pit. So I want to explain that last bit and we'll end off on this note. Is that Shmuel said, well, because the, the mission is now arguing with Shmuel and Shmuel can't argue with the Mishnah because the Mishnah is saying if you fall backwards, there's uh, no liability. So how would Shmuel explain that? Because he said whether it's impact or foul air, you're liable. And therefore, if the animal died on impact falling backwards, how could you make sure if the Mishnah says you're not liable for backward falling, how would Shmuel explain his reasoning? We understand Rav's reasoning. If you fall forward, you're liable because you, you breathe in the toxic air leading to the eventual death of the animal. And if you fell backward on impact, Rav doesn't consider impact in the public domain because it's not your earth that you dug the, uh, the pit from. So how would we explain Shmuel uh, giving a reason that the Mishnah says if you fall backward in the pit, uh, there's no liability? Because Shmuel would have liability if the animal fell backward and cracked its head on impact. So the answer is as follows. Is that the, the animal actually stumbled outside the pit because of the excavation, and it, it actually landed with its head outside the pit but its legs caved in under the pit. Do you understand what I'm saying? So imagine that this is an opening of a pit and the animal, instead of falling forward or fell backward in the, because Shmuel would say if the animal fell backward directly in the pit and hit its head, uh, there is liability because it's impact. But he's saying that the Mishnah here is talking in a case where the animal stumbled on the rocks surrounding the excavation or its, its feet collapsed. And it went like that, and the feet went in the pit, but the point of impact of the head was outside the pit. Therefore, it's not the pit that killed it directly. Therefore, there's, uh, uh, when the animal fell backward, uh, there's exemption, because the animal fell outside of the pit. That's Shmuel's explanation to the Mishnah. And we'll add uh, that note. I mean, I didn't work it out. Well done. Okay. So, uh, good, Gavin. You were on top form today. Arth, I know you're cooking, and I appreciate you being in the shear. I wish you better. Uh, I hope yeah. you have a full refuel. I hope you get a good night's sleep. Hey. A bounce yeah, yeah. foul air. Yeah. Okay. I was listening to the rabbi, and he said, because uh, you say, well, how can foul air, you know, kill you or damage K limb, et cetera? There was a story about this guy at the volcano. And he wanted to look at the air actually destroyed the actual outside of his metal glasses and the lenses fell out. So that's just showing you how air can kill or destroy. You know what? You're absolutely right. And in fact, in South Africa, they've got a lot of legal cases, Arthur. They've, I don't mm. know if you know about this with the asbestos mines, where people really work know. in asbestos mines and they die yeah. of, of lung cancer. 20 years later, because the particles were on a molecular level that you couldn't yeah, even You can't get asbestos out. You can't get you it out. Can't of get it out. Yeah. I had a friend of mine who worked in the asbestos mine years ago, and they landed up, they landed up living on a quarter of the lung and eventually dying. Yeah. And it, it just got worse and worse and worse. It's, it just clogs it up. It's the only thing you can't get out. Uh, yeah. uh, kind of scary there. And this guy also works with his and he died also at about uh, 8.50 p.m. 